Hi, I'm Hilary Russo. Thanks for joining me for the Holistically Speaking Podcast. I'm a certified holistic health coach and havening techniques practitioner, lover of great conversation, and of course, clever wordplay, holistically speaking. So welcome to an empowering place where my guests share their transformational stories of trauma to triumph through health, healing, and humor. It's the ultimate brain candy as we find out who we are, how we got that way, and what it takes to be a happy and healthy grown-up. And be kind to your mind. I'm glad you're here. Imagine not living your truth. What it would feel like to hide behind the person you know you are meant to be. Keeping you small, quiet, living a life of secrets out of fear. If you've ever doubted yourself or questioned who you are for fear of hurting others, or, well, being hurt, you're not alone. But let me ask you something else. What if who you are is not seen as, quote unquote, normal for most of your life? What if you were forced to continue on a path that impacted your emotional well-being, your happiness? That was how Don Ennis lived her life. Until she made a new choice. She chose happy. She chose kindness. She chose Dawn. You see, Dawn is a transgender woman. In fact, she was the first transgender journalist to come out in network TV news. But this award-winning journalist is also a single parent who lost the love of her life and is raising three kids on her own. She's an advocate for human rights. And when it comes to pride, well, with Dawn, there's no limit. So on this episode of Holistically Speaking, Dawn opens up about her own transition to truth, what it means to live in such a diverse and inclusive world, one that makes every single one of us matter, and how we can be better, be kind. And for Dawn, how coming out and sharing her true voice created a new space for life after dawn. I am so glad to have you here sharing space on Holistically Speaking. It's wonderful to uh, give you the opportunity to share your story. When we're talking about inclusivity and diversity, uh, this is an area that you really, that it's really close to your heart. You are part of the transgender community. I consider myself an absolute ally, and I've been very fortunate to work with you and others to share the stories that are out there. There's empowering stories, but your connection is really, really empowering. And I want to hold space for you to share the story. So thank you for being here to share that and um, being open I'm, to that possibility. I'm, I'm delighted. Absolutely. And one of the things I often say, I said it just this morning, it's more important, not that just trans people and LGBTQ people and intersex and asexual and all those folks are heard and speak. Those are important voices to listen to. But when allies speak, when allies join us and amplify our voices as you're doing here, that's when hearts and minds are changed. So thank you, Hillary. Well, I thank you. Uh, it's, it's an honor. And, you know, I feel like I learn. I've been learning over the, the time that I've been uh, given the opportunity to work on transgender medicine stories, learning about the process, the journey, and also seeing all that goes into the, the transgender medicine program and, and not just the program itself, but everything around that, you know, being and living in, within the transgender community, what it means to be transgender, what it means to be part of the LGBTQ community and live your life powerfully the way you are supposed to be living your life. And that goes back to your story. My story, it started really at age four. Mm. Hillary, I knew at age four, I was a girl, but my mother was not convinced. She said, no, I just think you're special. <laughs> and when I told her that other boys called me fag and um, picked on me. She said, well, you have to be tough. And fag is just an Irish word for cigarette, which, okay, that may be true in the old country, but it's not going to help me on the schoolyard. I knew that I was different. I knew that I was not a boy, but I followed the script. I played along. From age four until 17, 
I was a model. I was a child model and an actor. Appeared in hundreds of commercials. And my mother, sensitive to the fact that I felt feminine, took advantage of the fact that I was slim, uh, effeminate, high-pitched voice, and she got me some work as a girl. I did radio commercials and modeling. Sarah Jessica Parker. I'm trying to remember her other name. Uh, the famous Jordache Jeans Oh, model. Brooke Shields? Brooke Shields. What? Work the runway, you know? <laughs> Had a little mental fart there for a second, but it was wonderful. It was actually very affirming. But remember, I had to go back to being the boy in school and I got picked on and beat up and all that other stuff. Eventually, I just basically, you know, I had to stop because my father found out and he did not want his son wearing a bra. He did not want his son um living as a girl. So I went and did what I was supposed to do. Met a girl, married a girl, had kids. And then when he died, this is true for my best friend as well. It was like a dividing line in my life. I realized how precious and short life is. And I needed to do something affirming for me. And I decided that was when it's time to really confront this. I saw a gender therapist I realized that I had been bottling this up, hiding this all these years. I had been doing a great acting job, pretending to be a man. And when I asked my beautiful wife of then 10, 11 years for forgiveness, she said, you have to forgive yourself first because you've been lying to yourself even before you lied to me. Well, we separated. Mm. I went my own way. She went her way. We didn't divorce. It was in the cards, but unfortunately she uh, had cancer. Mm -hmm. So after I came out, um, we lived apart. After she died, I came home. I gave up my full-time job as an editor in the LGBTQ news site, uh, The Advocate, and came home to be a mom, raised my kids. I've been doing it now five years. I've worked in mainstream TV. I've worked in local TV. I've worked at uh, a magazine that you and I are very proud to be part of, uh, their television show. And I am, believe it or not, this is going to sound crazy, I'm one of two trans women who are out, who are on TV in America. Just two. Myself and a wonderful woman named Eden Lane in Denver. Mm. Doesn't seem right. There should be more. But the media business is, as you know, very fickle. And it does not see a path forward for someone like me. So I just keep plugging away. And uh, I'm also teaching now, which is one a wonderful thing I love doing. Is yeah, you and I have a lot of similarities in that way. I mean, we're both college professors as well. And you and I, both being adjunct professors working in the field of journalism and broadcasting, how receptive are they to this added, I'm going to call it a bonus, because they're learning so much more about you as a professional tell, and you as a human being. Yeah. I tell my students, I said, I don't have a master's degree. Now I am going to school for one. Mm -hmm. But my experience is all real world. Yeah. And it was interesting. In my very first class, I invited the dean to come and be a guest lecturer. And when I asked him about his experience, he had never been outside of academia. So I was like, okay, well, that's experience. It's just not the same. So my basic mission is to show students in journalism, public relations, and advertising what not to do through me. Mm. I've made mistakes. We had a sign in one newsroom, only make new mistakes. And it's a really wonderful way to live because everyone makes mistakes. Mm. I've made mistakes. and I've learned some of my best lessons by making mistakes. I've had trans people come to me and say, you know, because your life was out there in the media, because of all the missteps that happened to you, all the things that didn't go right, I've been able to avoid them thanks to your publicity. Wish it didn't happen, but hey, if it helps, it's great. Mm -hmm. So in the classroom, I am all about sharing my personal experiences. And I think sometimes that's a little bit better than what you read in a book. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the real world experiences. And it's funny that you mentioned that because I say that a lot. I'm, that, uh, and not to, not to downplay academia and full-time professors, oh, yeah. but there is something about being out there in the world and bringing it back. I know my students love knowing like, professor, where are you traveling to next? Professor, what's the next story you're doing? And not just here's the textbook, read what uh, I'm, what, what we should be doing in the world of journalism. And journalism has changed dramatically, as we know. 
And uh, sometimes Absolutely. I'm like, uh, it, it, it boggles my mind. And But we have to go with the changes as well. So being yes. able to be in yeah. something where they're learning from the experience of the now rather than the then, but history is important too, is, is powerful. So from moving from your students to family life, I, I'm intrigued by your story because first of all, losing, losing your love, your, your wife and her supporting you in a way that's like, you know, this is not, this is not part of how I want to be in a relationship and then losing her, uh, from cancer, which I'm very sorry to hear. And this is still relatively new. We're talking five years. So you took on a no, a whole nother role. In our home, there's only one mom. She will always be my children's mm. mom. And I'm not my kid's mom, but I do the job of mom. Mm -hmm. Society looks at women who are single parents differently than it does men who are single parents. Mm -hmm. There are different responsibilities and expectations. I do the job of mom and I do it well. And one of the things I love about being a mom is it's the hardest, most wonderful, rewarding job I've ever had. And I'm glad to say I'm good at it. But being a single dad, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful role too. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to put it down. It's just not the same. Mm -hmm. And my kids still call me dad. On the first day we uh, talked about, you know, me making this uh, change that they had seen evolving in me. They asked me, what are we going to call you? And I said, well, there's a couple of options. And after we went through the options, my youngest said, can't we just keep calling you dad? I said, if you don't mind the stairs and the weird looks, especially in the pool, that's fine with me. The only rule I have is I've asked my daughter not to call me dad in a women's changing room or in a ladies room. That could cause problems. So there she calls me by my first name, which is not comfortable, but it's better than having the police come. Understood. What a beautiful thing. I follow your journey a lot, just from knowing you as well, but also on, on social media. You're very open. Your children are very connected with everything you're doing, but I'm sure there have been some delicate conversations as well. Yeah. They're resilient. When I say they're resilient, people often say to me, wow, it must have been hard having a transgender father. And I say, actually losing their mother to cancer and watching her die is a lot effing harder. Mm. They lost the most important woman in their life. And the woman who's in their life now is their dad. And I will say this, while we had some tough times, my son was bullied because of me, my oldest son. My youngest son told his friends who claimed, you have two moms now. You can't call her dad. He said, no, she's my dad and I love her. <laughs> he was one of the first ones to say, I think you're transgender. And what's interesting also is my daughter was thrilled at the idea that she'd have someone to finally go shopping with, someone to do girly things with. That wasn't my late wife. Their mom was a homophobe. Now, I loved her. She was love of my life, but she did not like the idea of being seen as a woman married to another woman. We're in a car dealership. We're buying a car. And she forced me to say to the car dealer, look, I just want you to know we're not sisters and we're not lesbians. I'm her husband. I'm transgender. And he's like, okay, whatever. Mm -hmm. And she goes to the ladies room and he says, you didn't have to do that. And he says, I know, but I just thought it was important for her to have me say that. He says, yeah, I guess so. I thought she was your mom. And I said, don't say that to her. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's a very touchy area, I would imagine, because it's not yeah. just their dad is taking the role, as you said, of of the mom in the home. They've also lost their mom. So there's an extra yeah. level of compassion and empathy that needs to be in place because that could trigger some really powerful emotions, I would imagine. Especially on anniversaries. The 20th of every month is a hard day. Mm -hmm. January 20th, especially hard. Um, that was the day we lost her. Mm -hmm. January 27th, her birthday. And, you know, every holiday, every kid's birthday, every time Facebook reminds me of something we did as a family. Now, I'm not going to hide it. I have pictures of us all over the house, of their mom, of me before I transitioned, mm -hmm. of us as a family of five with me being myself. And I consider it just old pictures. I don't throw away baby pictures just because I'm not a baby anymore and my kids aren't babies. So I find that these pictures are reassuring and helpful. Mm -hmm. To me, the memories are actually restorative because five years on, you sort of forget the homophobia. You forget the 
the fights and the, the, the squabbles. You only remember the love and you remember the support. And what I want to just tell people who are listening, most people aren't so lucky. Some spouses completely cut off their, their, their transgender spouses. No children, no access, no support whatsoever. Parents disown now happened to me. My mom, I'm, I'm, I was 40s in my 40s, but my mom disowned me. I, I found out she was dead and was told I couldn't go to the funeral. So for most transgender people, taking this step comes of a very high price. But the alternative is to either live in a closet and pretend to be someone you're not or to end your life. And Hillary, I'm not going to lie, I tried twice. I'm very bad at committing suicide. I'm lucky for my kids that I am because had I been successful, they'd be orphans now. And the rate of suicide is not because of mental illness. It's because of rejection. It's because of a lack of acceptance. And don't talk to me about tolerance. Nobody wants to be tolerated. People just want to be. No one's trying to take over girls' sports or destroy women's sports or to take over women's spaces. Transgender people are, are uh, the gender that they say they are. I'm a woman, a different kind of woman. I'm not the same as you. But as we all know, there are lots of different kinds of women. Some women never have periods. Some women can't have babies. Some women have higher levels of testosterone. Women come in all different types. I'm just a different kind. I would never try to be a cisgender woman or to pretend to be. I don't come out to everybody. If somebody assumes I'm cisgender, I just let them go with it. But I will not attempt to be someone I'm not. And just as you don't want to look at other women in the locker room or a bathroom, I go in there to do my business and maybe touch up my makeup, my hair, and get out. That's what it's all about, right? It's just living. And that's all we're trying to do. I want you to touch on cisgender because I would imagine there might be some listeners who are finding this conversation educational and informative, as we hope, and as well as inspiring. So what would be the difference uh, to share with listeners what cisgender is? First of all, it's not a slur. And I know there are also listeners who are saying, I'm not cisgender, I'm normal. Well, that's nice for you. My late wife said things like that too. Mm -hmm. It's important to understand someone who is cisgender came up with a Latin root cis, which means same as, and a Latin root trans, which means opposite of or across from. All right. They did so to differentiate between women who were presumed to be female at birth and lived their lives as women and people who were presumed to be male at birth, but their gender identity, what's between their ears, not what's between their legs, tells them that they're female, like me. So trans or transgender and cis or cisgender, C-I-S. Now, some people think it's a slur, but it's just another way of describing. Human, woman, these are all words. All words are made up. No one's trying to take away anyone's identity or label someone that they don't want to be labeled. I won't call you cisgender. If you say to me, I don't like that term. Okay. Doesn't mean you're not. Doesn't mean I'm not going to think, well, she's a cisgender woman. It just means I'll respect your right not to be labeled as such, mm. but it doesn't erase it. Mm. What can cisgender people do? Cisgender people can recognize that if you're going to label trans people, well, why is it that you don't have a label? And how would normal be fitting? How would that be equal? So that's my challenge to anyone who objects to the word cisgender. Now, there's another word that people use, and this is a medical term that people who are opposed to transgender identities have adopted. It's called biological. People call me a biological man or a biological male. Well, Hillary, I have biology, and every ounce of my biology is female. My medical records, my state ID, my federal passport. My doctors, everything says F for female. The cells in my skin, after more than a decade of HRT, hormone replacement therapy, they're female. I'm not biologically male anything. And the use, they, these people use the word biological 
to try and differentiate instead of the word cisgender from people who are biological female. And the reason I oppose that word is because, first of all, biologists tell me it's a nonsense term. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really explain anything. And biology is a lot more complicated than people think. Whatever you learned in grade school or high school, you know, there are a lot of people who are chromosomally male or chromosomally female who actually have more female genes in a man than the average person. You don't know until you test. Who's going to go around testing people's DNA? So since we don't have DNA scanners on our phones, at least not yet, I ask people to just avoid the whole biological argument and just use cisgender or transgender. Or if it really upsets you, transgender and not transgender. Not normal. Really? I mean, who's making the litmus test of what's normal anyway? It, 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 not we're, me. We're, 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 I like we're all being a little abby normal. <laughs> I like being abby normal. I like being weird. I, some people use the word queer. And I know there are older people who don't like the word mm. queer. I use queer to identify myself. Now, when I first came out, my boss asked me, she said, so I guess you're lesbian since you're married to a woman, right? And I went, huh. Uh, yeah, I guess so. And then I started noticing certain male actors in certain movies that I really felt turned on by. And I was like, wow, this is different. Something I hadn't allowed myself to do because, God, you know, I was such a closeted, hidden person that I couldn't express my desire and interest in, in men in the male form. I might be bisexual. I don't know. I'm going to call myself queer. It's five years in. I've dated a few guys. I'm not really there yet. Yeah. Well, just be who you are. Enjoy it. Exactly. Do we all know exactly. it? we're all we're all trying to find our way home. You know. And I think women are also women are also a little bit more open to being different identities mm. and expressing love in different ways. One guy asked me on a date, transgender, what's that? And I was like, Oh boy, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> Get the wine first. <laughs> yeah. Oh, get the check get is what I said. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I do like guys. I do like guys. I, I've only loved one woman and I still miss her and love her despite our, you know, things that happened. Um, I just, I, I'm very grateful for what I've inherited. Um, this is uh, an amazing opportunity for, um, for me to be in contact and connection with my children. Mm. I was going to be this absent dad living 3,000 miles away who saw my kids on FaceTime and maybe once or twice every couple of months or something. Mm. Instead, I'm the most central person in their lives and I'm getting all goosebumpy and teary eyed thinking about it. Um, that's why I went on a health kick. I'm going to live forever. I'm going to be there for them as long as I can. You know, going back to the the family, uh, you you also are a devout woman of your faith, which I find truly beautiful, because it wasn't a faith that was another transition in your life, right? I I had to um, decide whether the church that I had grown up in. I mean, my mother brought us to church every weekday mm. and on Sundays, so I was rooted in the Catholic Church, an altar boy. Had Priest been allowed to marry, I might have even gone into a seminary. I did not want to be a single person all my life. I wanted to find that special someone. That was the script. Went to a Catholic all-boys high school. I'm still the only girl who ever graduated from it. And you know what? Even though I found acceptance in the alumni of my former high school, it just it felt weird. It felt weird to know that the pope, the bishop, the people who were leaders of my church, even though my local priests accepted me, even though my fellow congregants accepted me, that they didn't. Mm. I decided on what we Jews call yard site, the anniversary of my wife's death. We were in temple and I said, you know what? We decided even before we got engaged that we were going to raise the kids Jewish. When a Catholic gives birth children have to be baptized in the Catholic faith. When a Jewish woman gives birth, the kids are automatically Jewish. Mm -hmm. Done deal for me. We raised the children Jewish. Doesn't mean we didn't have a Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. My son said when he was three, he's now 22. Hey dad, how about you help us celebrate Hanukkah? We'll help you celebrate Christmas. And that's what we did all those years. I decided it was time for a change. I decided the temple accepts me. They embrace me. When I came out to the rabbi, before I came out to anyone in the world, 
he said, don't get a big head. You're not the first one. But he also <laughs> said, God made you in their image. Yeah. And God loves you. Mm. And I felt, this is a faith that accepts me and understands me and embraces me. And I began the process of conversion. It's a wonderful thing. Um, I am not really good at Hebrew, so don't ask me to speak any Hebrew. But I will tell you this, that I lead us in prayer every night. Um, and I, we practice, uh, uh, we observe Shabbat. And I am so glad to finally be going back to temple again mm -hmm. after a year away because of COVID. Um, my faith is not something I talk about much, mm -hmm. but it is just as so much a part of me as is being Irish, uh, being a Mets fan. I often say, Hillary, being trans is like the fifth or sixth most interesting thing about me. And I love the fact that I can express my Judaism to you because right now has been a really hard time for Jews. Yeah. And the politics of the world right now make it hard to be a Jew. But I'm as proud of my Judaism as I am of my children, of my um, New York Mets, of my Irish heritage, of my being trans. Oh, I, that, that is so, that hits me hard because I, I too, I mean, I, I was brought up in an interfaith home, but raised Jewish, obviously Jewish mother had the bat mitzvah, identify with Judaism, but I don't, I don't forget the, the faith that my, my father believes in my dad's side who my dad's no longer here, but, and I'm a Russo. So a lot of times that masks what people don't assume they're like, oh, she's an Italian. I am uh, partially right, but I get it. And I, and for a long time, like your son was mentioning, I and mean, we celebrated both, we had Hanumas, you know, but there's something where you can identify and be part of a community. And we are always looking for communities and tribes to be a part of, aren't we? And to know that you're accepted somewhere <laughs> is just, you know, it's, it, it sometimes the tribe accepts you when you don't expect it though. I was in Brooklyn for seven <laughs> years when I was single, I moved out and okay, this is a different time. I had a really big beard. And the Orthodox men would stop me in the street asking me to join the minion. One time a rabbi <laughs> opened my car door at a red light and he got in my car and I'm like, excuse me. He says, ah, take me over to heaven you are. And I'm like, you know, you got to be careful which car you're going to. He says, ah, you're a nice Jewish boy. It's fine. Oh, it didn't assume you were a taxi he driver. He right about just... one car. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> no, he thought I was just a neighborhood Jew, you know? And I fit in because I was looking like the tribe and uh, I dated Jewish girls there's a reason for dating Jewish girls. Um, but I will tell you that <laughs> my my passion for Judaism goes back long yeah. before my transition. Aren't we all a little bit Jewish anyway? Come on. Yeah, Come if on. you're in the New York area, a sure. little gay, a little Puerto Rican, a little Jew. A little bit of this, a little <laughs> bit of that. We're like a hodgepodge. Italian too. Yeah. Italian too. And I understand what you're saying as far as um, people assume, they presume. Yeah. You know, one of the nice things about um, being a transgender woman, I will say, is most people take me at face value. Sometimes my voice gives me away. I work on it. Mm -hmm. Hi, Hillary. I'm Dawn Ennis. I'm at the drive-thru right now, and I'd like to have a Big Mac. Because if I talk like this, people are going to say, sir. <laughs> so people are amazing in terms of what they use to base their judgment of you on, mm -hmm. your last name, what you sound like, what you look like. I wish people were just a little bit more open to allowing other people to identify and label themselves rather than making a swift judgment like that. Yeah, we're all a part of this. I mean, we're all in this together. But I think we're mm. learning. We're learning a lot. And, you know, going back to your, your transition, I mean, we talked about that just touch uh, and and feeling that lack of acceptance, which that word is just, it doesn't, it, I, uh, I, I feel I'm not even, I, I don't like that word either because it's like, there shouldn't be an acceptance. It should just be a B, right? So that would be nice. when you were going through the transition, I mean, you mentioned the hormonal therapy and, mm. and this is a process. And for those who might be thinking about it, it does psychologically take a, a lot to think about making this choice. I know that just from doing the transgender story. I mean, all the different mm -hmm. levels of what goes into bringing you to the person that you truly are, right? Can you share a little it's about It's not for about everyone that? either. No, I imagine And it's not, not. for everyone either because um, if you imagine you take a really macho guy and you start giving him estrogen, you start put, pumping him full of female hormones, he's going to go nuts because it's not going to match, right? Mm -hmm. We often say um, 
being transgender is different from being gay. Gay or sexual orientation, that's who you want to go to bed with. Gender identity is who you want to go to bed as. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine, Hannah Simpson, a writer, came up with this really, really easy to understand idea about gender dysphoria, this condition that affects a lot of transgender people. Not all, not all trans people have gender dysphoria, but a lot of us do. Hillary, are you right-handed or left-handed? I believe I'm right-handed. You think so? I am. If you, were, if you were writing with your left hand all your life, even though you had all these years of practice, how would it look? Writing your name. Like Dr. Scribble. Although my right, right hand also looks like that. <laughs> But it would not look as good as Correct. the hand that you're... Correct, because it's, you know, I'm, yeah. yeah. Right. So if I came along and then said, you know, try the other hand, try your right hand, you would be like, wow, this is how it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. That's what transgender is. Transgender is finally using the hand that you're supposed to be using all your life. My transition, I started on testosterone. I was so intent on remaining my wife's husband of proving to her that I was really still a man, that I put testosterone in my body for five years. You know what it did? It luteinized, it converted in my body mm -hmm. into estrogen, and it was like pouring uh, oil on a fire. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. It didn't take, because I'm not a man. When I finally did start taking female hormones, HRT, estradiol, it felt like a breeze through an open window. Mm. It felt as if, ah, oh, relief, a sigh. It felt warm, it felt like joy. I felt like, okay, I'm gonna cry at everything, including the opening of a paper bag, but those emotions were augmented, not stifled anymore. And um, it's sad to say, but all the publicity, I was the first transgender woman in television network news, had reporters hiding in bushes, other paparazzi knocking on doors of my neighbors saying, hey, do you know the tranny who lives next door? I had my ambush, I had my kids ambushed and it was just horrible. Headlines, shock jocks, I wasn't ready for that. I wasn't mm -hmm. prepared for the onslaught of media attention. When your face is on the front page of the New York Post, it's not a good day. I detransitioned. I had a mental break. I had like a, a circuit breaker, my psychiatrist said, go off. And what that basically told me was I needed time. I needed time to go back and went back a long way too. I, I was deluded into thinking it was 1999. It took me a while to really get back on my feet. And within a few months, not only did I know what year it was, but I also knew I had put myself back in a closet further than I had ever been, and I needed to find my way back out with help from mental health professionals, with the right tools. This time I came out and I haven't looked back. It's been seven years. A lot of talk about detransitioners in the news the last couple of weeks. Detransition is real. Caitlyn Jenner detransitioned. They went on hormones in the 80s, and it didn't take. There was something that just wasn't right. Same with me. A lot of people don't talk about detransition. I think that people who detransition have problems other than gender mm -hmm. that they need to address. That's why it probably they think that, oh, this will fix my issues. No, no. Changing your gender or affirming your gender isn't going to fix the underlying problem. If you're an a-hole, <laughs> you're still going to be an a-hole. But I, I did this. I stopped pretending. What my medical transition allowed me to be was adopt the secondary sex characteristics. My body shape, my body hair, all the things, the shape of my face. In women, it doesn't affect our voices. That's something you have to train for. In trans men, their voices get deeper. They get body hair, they get beards, mustaches, male pattern baldness. Mm. All these things happen because of medical transition. And for younger people, it's important to know Puberty blockers are like a pause button. They don't cause infertility. They are reversible. There's nothing wrong with them. It's not something that people have to be scared of. All it does, if a trans boy knows they're a boy, they're consistent, persistent, and insistent that they are a boy, puberty blockers stop their breasts from developing, their hips from widening. Mm -hmm. 
their period from starting or at least being as heavy. Trans girls don't get the Adam's apple or the facial hair, the body hair. Puberty is on pause and puberty blockers are a wonder. I wish I had those. My puberty was delayed through my mother's intervention. I don't want to talk about it, but let's just say what she did was wrong and I've moved on. <laughs> it's in my blog. I, I, I only want to say this. For children who identify as transgender, it's not a trend. It's not a fad or something that people do. And the thing that I've been learning about, Hillary, that I think more of us need to learn about is non-binary folks. There are non-binary folks, kids, adults, people who don't identify as female or male, don't identify as transgender, non-binary. Maybe they just identify as non-binary. There are all different kinds of ways to be. Like you said, can't we just be? Exactly. I say that all the time. And I have to remind myself too, even as a woman who knows she's a woman, identify as a woman, have not had the challenges and the questions in my mind that I'm anything other. It's a challenge. Just well, we're the most introspective people on the planet. We spend a lot of time. My Thinking. wife used to say, you nasal gaze, you nasal, you navel gaze a lot. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> even that it, it, it takes, it takes work to remind myself, just be present, be present, even in the work I do, you know, we yeah. have to constantly, we're works in progress, right? So all of us, absolutely. All of us. And, you know, something that I, I would love for you to touch on. And we had a conversation recently about this. Uh, is that we can't expect people to know everything, you know, it, op- be open no. to learning, be open to realizing, you know, maybe, and we're getting in this world where there's certain language we don't want to use. The term PC comes up constantly, inclusivity, diversity, all, every, everything with an IT, Y at the end. But when we're talking about coming up in June, the it's, it's pride month, right? We have Pride Week. Uh, there are some people that use the term gay pride, and that sits wrong with people. And there are some that make choices where they think it's just about parading around your gayness. And th- this is right. I mean, look, I mean, a lot of people go back to a time where it was it was shared differently, right? But what would you say about that? How would you approach that? First of all, I think it's wonderful that some people want to call Pride Gay Pride. It started as Gay Pride, 1970, the year after Stonewall, Gay Liberation March, mm-hmm. and yay, woo! And yes, there are people who wear very skimpy little outfits and jump and sing and dance, and that's all great. Pride is about celebrating our lives. Straight people have every other month of the freaking year... <laughs> And June is for gay people, lesbian people, bisexual, (laughs) queer, transgender, Mm -hmm. intersex, asexuality, whatever, polyamorous, polyamorous, yeah, all those folks. Mm -hmm. And here's the here's the thing that's important. If you call it gay pride, it's sort of like calling Columbus Day Italian Day. All right. First of all, most people call it Indigenous Peoples Day now, Mm -hmm. so let's get that right. Second. Columbus Day wasn't just for the Italians. It was supposed to be for all Americans, right? St. Patrick's Day, of course, you know, it's an Irish day, but it's a celebration of a Catholic saint. So these things all have multiple layers, intersectionality. So pride is all about all LGBTQ, et cetera. It's not just about gays. And I don't consider myself gay. I guess uh, the last years of my life uh, with my wife, I was in a gay marriage. Okay. Sort of struck us as as funny in a way, at least to me, (laughs) not to her. But what's really interesting to me is that we need to take the word gay and stop allowing it to be a pejorative. That's so gay. Or he's gay, meaning it's bad. Are we past that yet? Aren't we past using words pejoratively that mean something affirming? affirming? Um, And that's why I like the word queer. And I get it. Not everybody likes that word. Some people still use the F word, which is F-A-G, in a same way that some people use the N word with each other. I'm not a big fan of that because of my personal history with the F word. 
I don't really like the N-word either, but I understand that some people in songs and other places are going to use it. But I think that we, as a culture, instead of thinking about PC, put that crap to the side. Think about what it would feel like to have that word aimed at you. How many of us actually take the time to think about what it feels like to hear it? We're always so concentrating on what it feels like to say it. Mm, That's the resonance, like being put in the shoes of another person. How does this make you feel? How do those words resonate with you? What is it like to take yourself out of your current situation and put yourself in the, the, the body of someone else for a moment and just think, mm-hmm. how would this impact you? And it, yeah. I think if we are more open to understanding that, we are going to create a much more beautiful place to be if more of us understand the resonance in life and coming from that place of compassion and empathy and not just being like, oh, get over it. Or, oh, that's like, we're there. You, I hear Can't you that. take a joke? Right. Yeah. Can't you, ta- <laughs> Can't oh, you take gosh. a joke? Or lighten up. Or, yeah. And it's like, no. Yeah, you know? Or why is everything about, why do you have to be gay at work? Why can't you just be gay at home? That was one thing I, I really, I, I heard Ted Cruz talk about. And if I wasn't trans at work, it would mean I wasn't giving my 100% full being. Mm. If I was not, uh, if, if an athlete isn't LGBT out in their sports world, they're not giving their 100%. They're hiding something. They're holding something back. This is why it's important to be true, to be authentic. And by the way, I invite you to walk in my size 10 shoes, but I still think your little feet would tell, probably not I'd be stuffing them. the front of them with tissues, which I've done before when I when I would get hand-me-downs from like people who bigger feet. <laughs> I tried. I'm like a you're nine. Pretty feet. You're pretty. <laughs> I figured. I'm a 10, yeah. which, is, which is pretty lucky. I'm pretty lucky. I'm only 5'7", mm-hmm. and I'm, I wear size 10 women's shoes. I have a lot of friends who are over six feet who wear size 14s. And you know what? I know cisgender women who are also over six feet Mm. who wear size 14 shoes. We come in all different varieties. All of us. Yes, we do. What would you say about, um, you know, going forward, being that we are, well, I guess I can just ask you this. How would Dawn celebrate Pride Month, Pride Week, Pride Day? Pride in general. I call it a month. Yeah. I do the month. It's like um, a birthday. It's not just a day. It's the whole month, right? <laughs> I, I fly it an entire month. I fly a Black Lives Matter flag, except on U.S. national holidays, and I fly the Stars and Stripes. All through Pride, I fly a Pride flag, and I have other Pride flags for trans, and um, uh, my, my son is um, – my oldest son is gay. Mm-hmm. My uh, daughter is queer, and my youngest son is – Probably gay, but maybe not straight is what he wants to say. Mm-hmm. All right. So all three of my children came out after my late wife died. Not a coincidence. We fly those flags in our windows, in front of our house. We go to um, pride events. Um, I am recently named on the board of directors of the Triangle Community Center here in Connecticut. I'm also on the board at West Hartford Pride. Mm-hmm. And we have lots of events. Uh, I'll be writing stories about pride. And more than anything, I will be helping other people. I will amplify their voices, especially black trans women, especially non-binary folks, especially Latinas and Latinos and Latinx people, people who don't get the privilege that I've enjoyed. You know, I had 40 plus years of male privilege. I have still have white privilege. And I really see my position as someone who should pull up a chair and give up my chair if I have to, Point the microphone, point the camera and the spotlight on folks who don't have those privileges. That's what I do during Pride. We're going to actually share a link to the Connecticut Pride Center, which is part an organization you truly adore and believe in with how to support them. So thank you for doing that. Uh, any way you can support, whether it's Connecticut Pride, CT Pride Center, or another one, uh, that's just the one close to your heart. So I definitely want to hold space for you to share where you want to um, want the support to go. But anywhere we support, right, is a good place to support. I say that if you can do one nice thing, someone tells a joke, tell them it's not funny. One nice thing. Mm -hmm. When someone is struggling, buy them a cup of coffee, then mow them a couple of bucks. When someone is down, lend an ear. Call them up. Text them. Say, how you doing? Hold LGBTQ people close. Hold Jewish people 
close. Hold anybody marginalized close. Take the time to love and care for fellow human beings. I wear this pendant. Mm, you always it says, wear that. Be kind. Mm -hmm. It says, be kind. All I'm asking people to do is be kind. Love it. Love it. I want to close with one thing besides the fact that I'm really curious why you only like red M&Ms. I was reading that in your notes. Is there a reason? That was for my trailer. Yes. I want all red M&Ms and <laughs> it has to be, has to be um, in a bowl, not in a uh, plate. It has to be in a bowl. I've worked with people and like you before. <laughs> yes. No, I, I'm actually making fun of people who have these writers in their green yes. room. Because having worked 30 plus years in television news, Today Show, Good Morning America, mm -hmm. I was used to the writers for the green room. So I, in my no tailory, I said, only red M&Ms. Where will the hair but, uh, make a person be available for my, yes, for my podcast? Yes. <laughs> but I'm not that person. You are I'm not, not that, that person. person. And I am so fortunate to know you and call you a friend. And eventually whether it's wine day or wine o'clock or whatever, we're getting together at some point, but I do want to have a little fun with you uh, real quick okay. as I do with all of my fabulous guests. Is that where I go topless? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> you, you do you girl. Oh, no, we're not. No, we're sorry. not doing the topless That's part? the oh. after hours oh, okay. podcast. That's realistically speaking <gasps> after dark. <laughs> I, I got it mixed up. Sorry. I no. know. I know. I throw you a loop every once in a while. So I want to do a little word association. I'm going to throw out a word from things that we were mm -hmm. talking about. And I want you to just come back with one word real quick that comes to mind when I throw out a word to you. Okay. You ready, my friend? Ready. Okay, let's do it. I'm ready. Family. Love. Journalism. Writing. <laughs> Lots of it. Faith. Temple. Hmm. Transgender. Hmm. Oh, oh, I thought oh okay. You can go with the word. Hmm. Sorry. <laughs> That was my delight. Humana, humana, humana. Um, <laughs> a little Ralph Cramden. Huh? Yeah, right. Transgender. Me. Mom. Miss. Mm. Dad. Worship. Woman. Complicated. Pride. Always. M&M's. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Too many. Two words. Too many. Go for some M&M's right now. I don't care what color they gotta, are. They I should have, be a I rainbow have, of colors. <laughs> I do have a jar. Uh -oh. You're welcome to come over. Well, I have the wine and the M&M's. You come on over and we'll do it. Why do you entice me so? <laughs> so it's not sexual. No, I know. I know. <laughs> If I had a well, nickel with all my guests. You are a hot mama. You are a hot mama. Let's not, let's not oh, miss that. Sweet. Thank you. You're a hot you're mama welcome. too. All right. So in closing, what would you share Thank with you. speakers of Holistically Speaking? If you had, you're having a moment right now, what, what can you share as um, Dawn, life after Dawn, fabulous Dawn? People used to say to me, shouldn't that be life after Dawn? My birth name was D-O-N, Donald, after my father. No. It's a plan word, life after dawn, you know, the sunrise. And my name is Dawn, but it was before I, it was my exploration of myself before I came out. Mm -hmm. So 12 years later, here it is. It's still life after dawn. Um, I'd like to share this with holistically speaking listeners. You're never going to understand what it's like to be me. So don't bother. Don't try. I would like it if you tried. Don't go to the trouble. Just be kind. Just be nice. Just take that word you're going to say or that thing you're going to make a joke about and zip it. Hold it in. How many times have you written an email and said, okay, and no, I'm not going to send it because it's mean. I'm not going to do that. I'll delete it. But I needed to write it out. Think in here. Don't say it out here. Mm. I would just love it if holistically people could understand that the best way to interact with people who are different from you is to just interact. Being different is the most American thing anyone can be. So you don't have to be gay married if you don't want to be. You don't have to transition if you don't want to. But what does it do to you if I do it? It doesn't do anything. I'm not stealing your bathroom stall. I'm not going to take your daughter's place on the track meet. 
We're just all trying to live our lives as best we can. Be kind. And be kind to your mind. I would like that too. Mm -hmm. I, I will say this. I will say this. I am very grateful for all the therapists who have put up with me. My psychiatrist told me once, Dawn, the word I come up with for you is resilient. And he also called me a diva. <laughs> so <laughs> there's that. <laughs> Own it. <laughs> hey, babe, if it's true, that shoe fits. That's right. That size 10 shoe. <laughs> yes, ma'am. By the way, I love that you use the word holistically in your sentence. That, that Catch it on. Love it. I got it. You I got it. If, nailed if it. you ever go visit colleges, by the way, that is the word that every college um, tour guide uses, at least at one point, that they are holistic. Are they it's holistic? It's like this buzzword. Holistic. Well, they're not. The the holistic, <laughs> but not but not holistically speaking. Right. Well, that's that's my play on words, right? I, when you when you it's life yours. after dawn, I was like, oh, I get it. I love a little wordplay. You got you got you mm -hmm. got me right there. So, but just being you is how you got me, and I am so. I'm so happy that you shared your journey, your your story, rather, your your everything, and and just your being yourself. And I don't want you to be anything less than who you are, because um, we need more of you in the world. Not exactly like you, because we're all thank we're you, all, you know. But I'm you. trying to. I'm on Weight Watchers, so I'm trying to put less of me in the world. But I get your <laughs> I point. I think I found it. <laughs> I think I found whatever you're putting less of. <laughs> Thank you, COVID fifteen. <laughs> anyway, I, this was this was so wonderful, Hillary. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're a delight. Want to know more about Life After Dawn? Reach out to her on her website. That link is available on the podcast page. And you can make a difference and be kind by sharing this episode with one other person. You never know how one act of kindness can make a difference. And if you're enjoying Holistically Speaking, consider subscribing to the podcast and leave a rating or even a review. Your thoughts matter to me. And if you would like to learn more about how I can support you on your healing journey, let's set up a complimentary discovery call. Just visit my website at hillaryrusso.com slash havening and we'll go from there. Or you can even drop me a message on social media, LinkedIn, or even Clubhouse at Hillary Russo. Holistically Speaking is produced by Alan Seals with music by Lip Bone Redding. Thanks for listening. And remember, be kind to your mind and don't forget to laugh. <laughs>